Hi everybody, Rad Mom here. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. We're in this week's video, we're gonna be looking at the political divide that's brewing among the younger generation. How did this happen? Why do some people care so much? I have collected some clips for our perusal to guard our exploration of this topic, as well as conducted some interviews. Well, I talked to my kids. Uh, <laughs> Cause we have 16 and 18 who live with us. So I figured I would run some of this stuff past them and it was really illuminating. Sagar and Jenny's clip was probably the most informative, but not for the reasons that he was hoping for, I don't think. We're gonna let him summarize the topic. What's interesting is not the divide, but how actually new the divide is. Why should you even care about gender gaps in politics or in education? Because it profoundly influences who dates who, and thus who is going to reproduce, or even if that's attainable. We're gonna have to settle this question, I think, as a society. Is the reproductive nucleus the core of society or not? And if it's not, I'm gonna need to see some solid evidence of that. And if it is, this constitutes an impending societal collapse. Like, not to be dramatic about it or anything. For decades, young men and women in the U.S. had similar political ideologies on average. That's changed over the last six years. A Financial Times analysis of Gallup data found American Gen Z women are 30 percentage points more liberal than their male counterparts. 30 percentage points is kind of a lot. Like, most young people identify as neither liberal nor conservative, but, um... 30 percentage points is kind of a lot. Women aged 18 to 29 take more progressive positions on issues like immigration and racial justice than young men do, even as the sexes still roughly see eye to eye in older generations. Alice Evans is a visiting fellow at Stanford, and she joins us now to tell us why that gender divergence is happening in the United States and also, interestingly, in many other countries in the world. Uh, Dr. Evans, okay, why is this happening? At, well, I'll just start there. Why? My first thought was, why aren't we asking someone from Gen Z about this? So I think the evidence points to economic, technological, and also cultural changes. So basically everything? So younger generations tend to have what we call zero-sum mentalities. They believe that your success becomes at my expense. And that seems to be associated with growing up during weak conditions. Also, technologically, news media increasingly highlights one negative events, terrible atrocities. News media. Now, there's a phrase. Uh, like, the truth is in there, though, right? It's, it's, it's media. It's content. It's all content. And also in Western media since the 2010s, there's been much more attention to racial and gender bias. Do you suppose that's what this slide is referencing, where it says feminized public culture? Um, do you mean equalized public culture, where, like, everything is not a boys club anymore? But, but you know, what about rape culture? What about all the porn that's saturated everything? How pornified everything has become? Um... I'm sorry. I've, I've seen this a lot in this discussion about how culture has become feminized. Like, no, culture used to be super butch. And we've toned that way down. Yeah. That's not feminized. That's equalized. And then all that gets amplified by social media filter bubbles. Social media? Really? As we self-select into information and news that appeals to us, we then get cocooned in these echo chambers of agreement, righteous resistance, and very little debate. This is happening, but this isn't news. And you know what? It isn't new either. In doing my book research, I have read similar things said about the publication of magazines. 150 years ago. Magazine subscriptions were siphoning off people into smaller and smaller boxes where we were never going to come to a social or political agreement ever again. Magazines. Okay? That's not it. Has something changed? And then, because corporate algorithms want to keep us hooked on social media, they feed us one content that pleases us, that appeals to our priors, and also, you know, shocking examples of scandals of our foes. Aha! Corporate algorithms keep you addicted to this shit because your attention is their lifeblood. What she's doing is laying all this at the feet of capitalism. 
without naming it. That's what she's saying. So all that is encouraging ideological polarization, especially as younger people spend more time on their phones, less time in the real world with other people that actually probably agree with them in real life. Young people are on their phones too much. We can do better than this, surely. And then seizing on all those economic and cultural technological changes, cultural entrepreneurs try to tell their story and, and garner wider popularity. And by cultural entrepreneurs, you're talking about basically influencer, influencers seeing this madness and saying, well, I might as well make money off of it by poking at it. Yes, exactly. People like Andrew Tate. Opportunists are piggybacking off of this, off of this incredibly lucrative market that is your time. So if there are men growing up in economically difficult conditions and feeling resentment towards women getting handouts or foreigners getting handouts, they tell this story that, you know, you're not to blame. It's these women on quotas. So young men's economic frustration has been vented onto women the way it used to be vented onto minorities. Cute. Now, this... This f sounds terrible for society. And uh, so what are some of the ramifications of this in the areas of politics, economics, just general uh, healthiness of society? Well, it all depends on what we do about it. But if that ideological polarization continues, you might expect more difficulties for heterosexual love or family formation. Which is what I'm saying. We're going to need to ask ourselves just how important is the nuclear family, really? If you don't want kids, don't have them. But like, everybody started out as a kid with a mom and a dad. How does the human psyche like form to begin with? You found that the U.S. wasn't the only country with this split. There were divisions in China and then also South Korea. All the same causes or are there idiosyncrasies in those, those countries? Right, so that's a great question. China and South Korea traditionally have very strong sun preference, so men are revered. The society has been equalized, not feminized, because men used to have such a strong preferential treatment, and now they're not getting that. They're legit upset about that, um, which maybe we should talk about. And even though both countries have become much more gender equal, you know, South Korea's historically high sex ratios men, mean that men face the world's worst dating market. So they're constantly getting rejected, getting re rebuffed, and that feeds into resentment, loss of status, and then they vent online. Meanwhile, Korea has seen massive feminist activism, again, in those social media filter bubbles. So Korean women are becoming much more liberal and egalitarian and feminist, where men are continuing to vent and feel that frustration. So it's not just the filter bubbles, it's the fact that those filter bubbles are like quasi sentient. It's the algorithm that responds to you in a way that a magazine doesn't. So the last question, Alice, is, is there any way this is temporary or that it can be addressed because it feels like it just kicks out the legs from under, you know, the structure of a healthy society? And this is where I'm going to make the distinction between society and civilization. OK, society is the network of relationships between people and the civilization is the structure that we build around that. I think it's possible for the society to collapse and the civilization to keep chugging on like a zombie, okay? So we're all just going through the motions. Meanwhile, nobody cares about anybody and nobody, none of it means anything to any of us. Meanwhile, you can look around and say, but everything hasn't fallen apart. Everything's still chugging along. Why fix what's not broken? Oh, it's broken. I think if corporate algorithms are feeding us sensationalist, shocking content and then keeping us cocooned in echo chambers, you know, deluding us with other about what other Americans think, we might want to change that. And, you know, there are all kinds of regulation that could break up those corporate algorithms and break up those filter bubbles. And then we can just start talking to each other again and realizing, you know, building empathy. We can just start talking to each other again. Like, that's so easy. She's treating this as if it's some sort of delusion, essentially. I think that there's a real material basis to these issues. And um, just blaming capitalism and suggesting regulation doesn't fix anything. If only women voted Democrats would win by a huge margin. Now, Sager is very passionate about this topic. I found his hypothesis to be intriguing. If only men voted, the same would happen for Republicans. So once again, there are important exceptions to this rule, but the more true that it becomes, the bigger problems you are going to have. 
What stunned me was not just that this is true for adults, but it appears true even for the emerging generation of teenagers. Some new data unearthed by Daniel DeVise at The Hill, buried within the Monitoring the Future survey from the University of Michigan, finds that the political identities of 12th grade boys differs starkly from the political identities of 12th grade girls. So this is even younger. This is the youngest possible voting group, 18 year olds. The Michigan survey finds, quote, 12th grade boys are nearly twice as likely to identify as conservative versus liberal. For girls, it could actually be more different. As the survey finds, quote, the share of 12th grade girls who identify as liberal rose from 19% in 2012 to 30% in 2022. Only 12% of girls identified as conservative in last year's survey. So what I got on this was that these concerns are based in actual material issues, wherein girls are grateful and, you know, happy with the physical autonomy that they have achieved and they don't want to give that up. And boys are struggling with the realization that they are not going to get some of the privileges that they have seen older generations possess. Those are both real things. We cannot just wish this away. What's interesting is not the divide, but how actually new the divide is. As they note, quote, as recently as late 2000s, liberal boys occasionally outnumbered conservatives, and back in the Carter era, both boys and girls were leaning towards liberal. As researcher Gene Twenge actually found in a new book published Generations, the difference in attitudes between 12th graders has never been bigger than today. This is a backlash to some of the successes of modern feminism. Backlashes are not just old men being bratty that stuff is changing, okay? Sometimes backlashes are based in, you know, material difficulties. <laughs> What's really interesting is that over a five-year period, girls became slightly more liberal, but it's boys in particular who became much more conservative. Because it's boys in particular who are being confronted by this. It serves the girls. They're fine. Give it another 10 years of this drift and we'll see how that goes. Dating and political polarization amongst gender lines creates a dramatic mismatch in the availability of mates, both genders, as they age up to the point where they desire a permanent partner. Culture is telling men that they're not wanted and they're responding accordingly by becoming both less desirable as mates and becoming more self-loathing and angry with the internet as a vehicle. Oh, really? When I summarized this for my 16-year-old, he said, that's the definition of an incel. We're not all incels. Sagar, I think you might be telling on yourself here, honey. Step one, at least, is acknowledging that we have a problem. We definitely have a problem. It's okay to be a man, and it's also okay to care about men. <laughs> no one reasonable would suggest it's not okay to care about men. If someone is making that suggestion, that's an unreasonable suggestion, and you can disregard it, Sagar. Come on. So I'm clear, uh, curious what you thought, Crystal, about that. Uh, G hey, guys, obviously I had a lot of thoughts on what Sagar had to say. <laughs> that one cuts off in a funny spot. I asked my 16-year-old, you know, it, I know this is going to sound corny, but do you feel like your manhood is rejected by society? And he asked me in all earnestness, what does that mean? I said, I, 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 I don't know. And he, he, he told me that he just sees himself as a person for the most part and does not really think about it that way. He's not preoccupied with that. Sagar, honey, I do not think everybody is as preoccupied with that as you are. Here's my theory about why people like Andrew Tate have got such traction. And yes, this is Piers Morgan, but this clip is mwah, pure gold. With young men. They all feel a little bit put upon. Yes, right. They feel like it's now a new culture. It's gone, the pendulum's gone too far. And that, yeah, a lot of bad guys got done in with rightly by Me Too and Time's Up. But actually, this culture developed where all men are awful until they can prove otherwise. I don't know what world you live in, Piers. Maybe, maybe people just treat you that way. And young guys are like, gee, what do yeah. I do? Right, okay, it is hard to be a young man at the moment. There, are, there is enormous pressure on young men. Maybe on social media. But that's not because of feminism. Women have not caused that pressure to be put on young men. We've got a huge issue. I don't agree. Issue. I, think some, I think a lot of radical feminists so what do have. you think well, caused What are you it? talking about? What are you talking about, Beers? What radical feminists? What is this boogie woman that you're invoking here? And, and how are they got to be so powerful and nobody nobody knows about it? What What is this, Piers? Radical oh. feminists exist. What, what, I know you it? find this hard to believe. But what are radical feminists? Uh, We've been on here Man-hating women who lead a charge to hate men. 
They do exist, these Don't, people. I mean, I mean, come on. How I'm, many I'm of those do you really know? I, I, That's not what a radical feminist is. Um, extreme misandrists do exist. Man hating isn't feminism. It's not about you. Well, I'm, well, I'm me. conscious that I don't want to interrupt my my fellow. So no, feel free. Um, but look, uh, radical feminists exist. Radical, um, you know, we have toxic masculinity, and yeah. we know that we still need feminism because we have people like yourself in in these great um, positions who will go on to X and say, for example, that our female female footballers were over emotional in the uh, finals of the Women's World Who Cup. Who said that? Um, mm. I didn't say that. I what? think you'll find Over you emotional. Did. I think you'll find you did. Why were they all Ooh She caught you. I'll send you I'll send you across the, across the article. Well I don't which, which here's my suit about emoting. I don't by the way, I don't like it when male footballers emote too much. Mm. I don't like the blubbing culture. Mm. Full stop. Mm. I'm a stiff upper lip let's, guy. Let's and I know he's gone out of fashion. I know I'm not allowed to be, but I like a stiff upper lip. I like the old way, I like the old pathy news footage with people going. Go, pull, get a grip, and, and we've got put yourself together. Male suicide. <laughs> Pierce is just such a beautiful example of like a classic entitled man. Male suicide rates. No, I know it's a totally that, separate that thing, well, it, which I take, totally separate which thing. I take and very it's, seriously. And it's the has same nothing to do with the blubbing culture. Uh, men being able to express their emotions has absolutely nothing to do with their emotional state generally. That's what you're saying. It's the same with feminism, and I, and, I, and I worry that this feminism and the definition of feminism has been overtaken in the same way that the definition of woke has been overtaken. Thank you. Feminism is about the, 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 the striving for equal rights, and that strive is by men and women. Uh, well, we can debate that. What is feminism about? Somebody, please, tell me down in the comments. Mm. It's not about hating women. I agree and with you. And yet, funny enough, funny enough, men, and yet fun It's not about hating men. It's not. Misandry is not feminism. Aggravating at least half the planet and stoking the flames of the battle of the sexes hurts women in the long run. Hating men is not what feminism is about because it's not about you, boys. Okay? And she's just said this, these two really important key things that everyone should be saying. Feminism has been co-opted as a term and it is not about hating men. And so he interrupts her with, what? And, and yet, funny enough, I agree, I agree having, having won so much fairness and equality quite rightly, yeah. and I applaud that, the moment the transgender lobby come along, I want to erode those rights. You two, that's oh, that's fine. Yeah. That's yeah. fine. I mean, and, that and now all of a sudden we're talking about the trans movement. What? Oh, my God. Did he do that on purpose? He did it so quick I almost didn't catch it. You suppose that's a coincidence? I don't know. Well, and give them all back. Must, you must I mean, well, that give them all back, Isabel. Ava, I want to know, because you did acknowledge that it's extraordinarily hard to be a young man now. So what do you put that down to if it isn't radical feminism? I would say and so we have Blondie here representing the masculine narrative. Yeah, look, I mean, if you look at some of the, the, the reports that are... Uh, May, uh, created by right-wing think tanks, a lot of that to do with the struggles of young men is to do with finance and it's to do with yes. the economy. Yes. So you'll have poor white young men I mean, who are in poor. areas yeah, who are defunded and they're not being offered... They're not the being finances. offered... No, but younger teenagers are sitting there worried about whether or not they're going to be able to get a summer job and afford to take a girl to the movies or what the fuck ever kids do these days. <laughs> You still need money to do it. Mental health treatment. They're not being offered good teachers. They're not being offered, you know, good finance in yes. the good economy in their schools. Generation Z, we're talking about 16 and above, yeah. is my understanding. And we are, and I agree with Ava, we are in a world now where we're expecting these 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 21-year-olds to go into a place of work where work no longer pays. Mm. We are in no, a yeah, generation that, where it we are... Why well, they're, it, why they're of distressed. Of course it is. Of course it is. It always is. It's always about the money. It's always about having enough material wealth to get by. As a teenager, you are thinking about your future and about your life and what you're going to be able to do with it. How patronizing. When you have a situation where you have a young male who is looking around and trying to understand, do I be go into crime? Do I become a drug dealer? Do I be become an X, Y, or Z? Or do I sit back in my chair and say, well, I can't do the job I want to do because of her. I can't do the job yeah. I want to do because of an immigrant. I can't do the job I want to do because of wokeism, whatever that means. This is a classic thing that politicians have used against the working class since the beginning of time. And now they're splitting us up 
along the lines of reproductive sex as well so like we can't even go home and like have a good cuddle it's, it's insidious and, and we collectively are going to have to ask ourselves whether or not the basic family unit is worth saving it's bang on because feminism. Because the whole thing so yeah, because the young men here. You've young men way off. I have young a men are upset son. because they're not I'm able. gonna trump you both on this. <laughs> I have a I've teenage three. son mm -hmm. and he's pretty interested, or certainly was before he got himself into so much trouble in Andrew Tate. Mm. <laughs> I think that says everything, doesn't it? Right. Like a lot of young men are, and it's and what nothing, did Andrew Tate it's do? nothing Andrew to Tate, do with them not Andrew Tate worrying about the problems money. with young. What do you mean Andrew Tate's popularity has nothing to do with young men worrying about money? Half the shit he does is brag about how much money he's got, and the other half of the stuff he does is brag about how many women he's got. There's a direct connection there. Look, you know, young men used to have a social contract. They would go to school, they would go to university, and then they would be able to get a job that provided for their family. Yes. The economy now doesn't offer them that opportunity, and they are angry about it, and they're rightly and angry. They're also being, and they're also being told all day long, all men are awful. Prove otherwise. By who? By Andrew Tate. By, by radical feminists. By but since when are radical feminists in charge of everything, and why hasn't anybody told me? Somebody has been forced to give up some privileges and they're like, why do you hate me? I'm so miserable. Oh my gosh. Women everywhere do not hate men everywhere, peers. Um, do you need a vacation, honey? Men are saying in. that this is where this message comes from. Whereas we know... If that women even, just even stopped COVID, hating men a little bit, it would be really helpful to the self-esteem you know of young to, men. If we started treating each other equally, All right. then perhaps there wouldn't be this problem. You know what? Got to leave it there. Uh, and I can't leave it there because I'm a man and I'm in charge of this show. <laughs> so, thank you, ladies. Thank you, Piers Morgan, for being such a beautiful illustration of exactly the problem. Feminism and women generally appears to have been made into a scapegoat for, you know, the younger generation of men. And there's a, there are apparently some entitled old shit cans who are perfectly happy to help build this narrative. And then there's guys like Sagar. They both look like they need a vacation. Men blaming women for their problems is one of the oldest tricks in the book. Men collectively need to sort of put on their big boy pants and take some responsibility for the fact that society is changing. And some of them are on board with it, and some of them aren't. I think we know who's being louder. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of society. It's not the fall of civilization, but... It is an issue that is that, that warrants our attention, and it's certainly a feminist issue. I'm going to close it there. I will see you guys at the top of the hour for the live stream and discussion where we can argue about this some more. I have been Radmom. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you all next time. Bye.